The impact of computing is the big idea on the AP exam. It's going to take up about 21 to 26 percent of the questions, about a quarter of the test. This part of the exam asks you what are the costs and benefits of how rapidly computing has scaled and spread. Already, the fact that you're watching this video shows that computers have changed the way things like education work and the way even people prepare for tests. And you should be able to examine, discuss, and articulate some of the costs and benefits associated with these changes. One of the tricky things about discussing beneficial and harmful effects is that there's going to be a lot of necessary vagueness to it especially when discussing things like ethical issues, where there might not be clear right answers. And so let's set a few anchor points, a few baselines that we can confidently say, and then just kind of explore some of the topics you might have to consider. So one of the more concrete things is that computer innovations will change how people complete tasks. Again, it's a little vague, but hopefully you can see that it is something you agree with. It's changing how you're studying, for example. But these changes and what else could be done with these changes aren't always anticipated. The internet, for example, was mostly used by researchers at first to share ideas in things like science and share data sets and results. And now you can play spaceship games on it. There's going to be these unintended, unintended consequences. And there's going to be unintended consequences that are both harmful and beneficial. And that's all going to be up to whoever is discussing it. Something that might benefit you might harm me or vice versa. And those things might also work differently at different scales. You might have cities that benefit from technology, but certain individuals in, within that city might be hurt by the same thing. It's hard to say anything concrete about this without having a lot of nuance to it and a lot of discussion about some of these implications. One lens to help you narrow these things down with is thinking about these changes in terms of either society, culture, or the economy. Maybe it's the way people behave, the expectations people have, or the way people do business. To be a responsible programmer, you should consider these outcomes as you develop a program, if you're making something like a new social network or a new networking tool. But at the same time, you do have to acknowledge that it's impossible to know all the different ways this innovation will be used. You might come up with a social network design just to talk about gaming, and it couldn't end up being great for business or something along those lines. In addition, these effects, both positive and negative, can change dramatically as things scale way beyond your expectations. Some social networks might have started out just for the use of college students, and now almost everyone in the world could be on this network. There are some positives, and we do want to dwell on some of the positives, just to keep things a little upbeat, um, that come with this new access. More people now have access to information, and that includes information about problems that exist. And so there's new ways to approach solutions. There's things like crowdfunding where if multiple people think that an idea is worth sponsoring, they can contribute little bits of money towards this bigger project. There's crowdsourcing, where you can reach out to a variety of people for new ideas and perspectives. And there's things like citizen science, where researchers can ask the public to collect data. Sometimes people don't even need to put in actual physical effort to, lead their, to lend their help to these projects. Sometimes it can be as easy as just lending processing power. You can install programs on your computer that when you're not using it, it's doing some math and doing calculations, solving complex problems in things like science, like building proteins and discovering new vaccines. Crowdsourcing also just opens up the door to new networking opportunities. If you have problems that you can't think of solutions for, it can connect you with people who might have those solutions or at least means to figure one out that you wouldn't have been able to talk to before something like the internet existed. But there are problems you need to acknowledge. The main problem with technology right now is a phenomenon called the digital divide. There are inequalities with the access to things like the internet and technology. Things like smartphones are incredibly beneficial, but there's a paywall and an access wall beside, behind who can get them. In addition, there's issues with the infrastructure who has access to a reliable network to get the most out of something like a smartphone. And this happens on different scales. This happens on the scale of different countries, to different groups, to individual schools, or even classrooms. Just like before, the actions taken by individuals, organizations, or governments can affect the digital divide. It could lessen it, it could improve things, or it could increase it, and sometimes unintentionally. One thing you have to acknowledge is that as human beings, we have biases. 
And as human beings, we're the ones who create these computer programs, and thus our biases can be reflected in them. Even if we're not the ones creating these programs, we might contribute to the data that helps these programs run. And again, our biases might live in that data. If you're a developer, you need to be taking active steps to reduce the bias. It could be as simple as just incorporating diverse perspectives in the team you're working with, or just seeking out feedback, putting out initial beta versions of your product, and listening to what a variety of people have to say about it to make improvements that help your product reach the widest variety of people as possible. But just like all things, combating bias is going to be an ongoing process, and it's going to happen throughout all the levels of not only development, but computer science, even to the academic level, for things like the digital divide, reducing access to things like education. Another concern we'll have with computers has to do with intellectual property. If you create work, you hold a copyright over that as long as it's something original, or maybe the company you work for that paid you to do it owns the rights over that. The problem is, is that work has never been easier to distribute than now. You can find someone else's artwork and copy it instantly, or someone's video or someone's music and copy it within milliseconds. And this makes it difficult to protect your own intellectual property, especially if it's something that you rely on for a source of income. As a creator, you have to take active measures now to safeguard your own property on the internet. And if you are using other people's property, you should be actively considering if you have the rights to use it, or if you need to pay money to have access to it, or if you shouldn't be accessing it at all. There are systems like Creative Commons and open source where creators are openly sharing their work with the public. Maybe they're putting some limits on it. With Creative Commons, for example, they say, yeah, you can share my artwork, but you can't change it. Or maybe can't monetize it. But there's other indirect ways technology are gonna, is going to impact copyrights as well. It can change access. If someone creates a video streaming site, they're not explicitly copying some other movie, but they've now given access for you to watch the movie that you might or might not have the rights to watch yet. Regardless of all this too, there's also just ethical effects because this new access or these new products could be used to influence social or political issues. And those things don't always have clear answers, and these things can get messy. And it's not something where we're hoping for a solution, just a discussion, just something to get the ball rolling and to figure out how to solve what problems can be solved. When you're using a computer, you need to be using a computer safely and responsibly. Because sometimes the downsides take time for it to, for it to have an impact on you. One big thing you need to worry about as you use the internet is personally identifiable information. This is things like your age, your race, social security number, your birthday, um, your biometric information, things like how you look or your thumbprint as you start using things like that to unlock your phone. Because as you use different websites, different websites might collect different information. The technology and the way the internet has been linked allows all that information to be aggregated together. And it can paint a really clear picture of you as a unique individual. And a lot of this data is given up voluntarily or sometimes ignorantly. Sometimes when you go into a website, you just blindly click accept, or you just install a new app and you randomly give it accept for permissions like phone calls, even though it's a calculator app. And sometimes this even happens maliciously, where even if you told it an app that it doesn't have permission to do something, it might collect that data anyway. But this isn't necessarily a completely bad thing. There's a conflict between privacy and utility here. Because marketers and salespeople and things like that have better ideas of who you are as a person through data, they can give more relevant recommendations. They can recommend scholarships that you might be qualified for because they know something about your demographics. It's something you have to negotiate with yourself. How much are you willing to share given the benefits, but also knowing that you are sacrificing your privacy to get those gains. This is a tricky decision to make because once information is placed online, it's virtually impossible to get rid of it. It might be anonymized in some senses, but it can still be combined with other ones where you can't actually claim ownership over it. And even things you willingly share can't, can be taken out of context. You post something on a social network, it can be shared by other users on that social network. One way to help protect your data is through authentication or authentication. Authentication is things like using a password. It makes sure that the information you're looking at, maybe it's a bank account, maybe it's a social media account or something like that, 
is only accessed by the intended recipients, usually just you. Beyond just a password, though, you should strive to use multi-factor authentication. This is where you use something in addition to a password. You use two or more forms of information that prove it's you. Knowing a password, receiving a text message on a phone you're holding, or maybe you have a dedicated device. Maybe it's a geolocation. You can only access a website from a less specific location, physical location. Sometimes it's biometric data, like a thumbprint or face scan. That's it, even with your level of protection, the protocols themselves to transmit that data also have to protect it. And so when data, those ones and zeros of say, your bank account information is sent from the bank to you or from you to the bank, it's encrypted. It's mixed up and scrambled in a way that even if someone could access that data stream, since it has to bounce between different routers to get to its destination, they don't know what it means. There's a couple systems to encrypt data. There's symmetric um, encryption, that's where the system you use to scramble it, maybe it's, you know, switch all the ones to zeros and the zeros to ones, is the same way it's used to decrypt it, unscramble it. You switch all the ones back to zeros and all the zeros back to ones. But this isn't necessarily secure because if you know how to encrypt these messages, you know how to decrypt it. And someone might figure out how to do that. A much more secure method is called public key encryption. Public key encryption involves you or someone sending out this public key to encrypt messages. So you send out the system and say, use this key to lock the message. Anyone can see the way to lock it, but only you have the private key, which is the only way to decrypt it or to unlock it. This works through a complicated system of one-way mathematics that we won't get into, involving modulos and prime numbers. And it technically isn't perfect, but you, the only way to brute force it would take a scale of time way beyond a human lifespan. Once you have these encryption systems set up, you reach out to third-party digital certification sites that can give you a digital certificate that says your encryption method is secure. There are some dangers when using computers. People do use computers maliciously. Some of the things they might do are write viruses. So viruses are software and it works just like a biological virus, where it can get into your computer, replicate itself, and then get access to places that you might not want it to. Malware is software that's designed to damage or even control your computer system, so that maybe it can make your computer participate in a botnet for things like distributed denial of service attacks. And even if things aren't built necessarily maliciously at first, all real world systems are going to have errors and flaws that might be able to be exploited. Computers are physical circuits. You could even manipulate the electromagnetic field from the currents running through something like a CPU to mess with the memory and other parts of the circuit. In addition, there are more active attacks people can use um, to get some of your information. Phishing is one you see very commonly where people make, say, mock-ups of the login pages for popular sites. They'll make a page that looks just like the site you use to log in to check your grades, send it to you going, hey, you should uh, log in and check your grades. And if you don't check the URL and you don't check that it's the actual site, you might accidentally type in your password and give it to someone who can then use it on other sites as well and try to get access to your information. Other systems like key logging, will just go into your computer and keep track of everything you type in. That can tell someone your passwords in addition to all the different procedures and protocols you use on that device. And you can always just intercept data through a rogue access point. So as information is going over the internet, it goes through the rogue access point and they have access to that data. And if it's not well encrypted, they can decode it and figure out exactly what it is you were transmitting. And finally, there's simpler attacks too. People could just send malicious links in emails that might seem like you know, something you want to click on. Maybe it says you've won $500, you just need to click a link. Those might install malicious programs like malware or viruses onto your computer. The best thing to remember is there's no such thing as free lunch. If something seems like it's too good to be true, unfortunately, it probably is. <laughs>